Coming up on The Breakdown, honoring American servicemen and women who made the ultimate sacrifice ahead of Memorial Day. We'll break down the latest headlines, plus former Navy SEAL and president of Veterans for Responsible Leadership, Dan Barkoff joins us. And later, former commanding general, Europe and the 7th Army, retired Lieutenant General Mark Hurtling. And we'll take your questions from Twitter. Use hashtag AskTheBreakdown. It all starts now on The Breakdown. Good evening and welcome to The Breakdown. I'm Tara Setmayer and this is the Rick Wilson. Rick, good to see you. You're a, he's, a, he's a man in demand already. Good to see you, Tara. Sorry, <laughs> I, uh, I, I just committed the second cardinal sin of, of, of live television, of leaving my ringer on. So I have corrected that. Ben, I will call you back. <laughs> eh, listen, we, we commit many on-air cardinal sins according to cable news standards. So eh, it's part of our savoir faire. People love it. Love us for it. <laughs> anyway, um, it's good to see you, Rick. And as well, always, well. it's good to see you guys. Please send us your questions for the evening. If you have questions for us or for our guests, tweet us at hashtag AskTheBreakdown, and we will answer your questions on air later in the show. Um, Rick, so well. tonight we have a couple things going on. Um, we're focusing on honoring our fallen heroes ahead of Memorial Day on Monday, yep. which I thought was really important. You know, we had talked about this as a group. Um, and so tonight we're dedicating our show to that. And we have two great guests who both served our country um, honorably, and they'll be joining us For in sure. a few minutes. You guys, you're going to love them. Um, they're both dynamic in their own ways and bring decades of service. So looking forward to that conversation. And later on in the show, we're going to share some personal tributes to honor the memories of the greatest generation who also served in our own family. So a little personal touch tonight on the breakdown. So make sure you stay around for that later on in the show. But first, Rick, let's get to the headlines. Let's do it. I am just so incensed by what has been going on with the January 6th commission. You know, we've been talking about this for months, ever since the, mm -hmm. the event happened, that there needs to be a 9-11 style commission. We thought we had a deal, right? M uh, yep. McCarthy empowered Representative Katko to negotiate with the Democrats to try to work out what they wanted, come to a deal, and they came to one. And I wonder if Nancy Pelosi called their bluff. Like, did Republican leadership in the House think that they would never agree to what they wanted? And Nancy Pelosi was like, okay, we will have a, you know equal number of Republicans and Democrats on the commission. We will have the chair and vice chair have to just uh, agree on subpoena powers. The ball's in your court. What are you going to do? And here we right. are now. It, it passes the House, right? Only 35 Republicans, I think, vote for it. Um, mm -hmm. Now it's in the Senate where anything of substance goes to die. And we're waiting on the Senate. I don't know if the vote has happened yet. It was on the schedule possibly for tonight. Um, waiting on the Senate, and they need 10 senators to vote for this. It needs to be a veto proof. You need 60 um, so that they can't, they can't filibuster, I'm sorry, filibuster proof. So they can't filibuster it. Well, guess what? It looks like it's dead. And we can thank our buddy, Mitch McConnell. And by our buddy, we mean one of the most shameless and horrifying people to ever um, blacken the, 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 the reputation of the Senate. Um, he went out today and asked for people as a personal favor to kill the commission as a personal favor. Now, look, Outrageous. Mitch McConnell is, you know, we, we don't expect a lot from Mitch McConnell here at the Lincoln Project, but what we do expect is that once in a while, other Republican members hopefully would stand up and think I should do the, the correct patriotic and moral vision instead of bending the knee to Mitch McConnell once again. But I promise you, um, you know, the, 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 they'll say they had such qualms. They were worried about it. They wrote a straight letter, uh, you know, and they will do what they always do when it comes to McConnell. They will do exactly what he wants. So and let, it, let it me is, explain. It is, it is a huge loss for our nation, and yes. it is a disgusting example of why Mitch McConnell shouldn't be in. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm getting on a yeah. rant. I'm getting no. going. No. 
No, no, <laughs> go ahead. Um, you're right. It's the exact reason why Mitch McConnell should never see the Senate Majority Leader title again. The fact that it, it, it's, it takes um, a lot for the Senate majority leader or minority leader, anyone in leadership to start whipping votes like that, that means that he's got a real stake in it. And what I was heard, what I was hearing today yeah. and what's been reported is that the family members of some of the Capitol Police officers, mainly um, the mother of Brian Sicknick, who died the day after the insurrection, um, Gladys Sicknick, right. uh, she wrote um, a really powerful statement and um, she went up to on what uh, went up to the hill along with Officer uh, Fanon, who was the D.C. police officer, Metro police officer, right. who um, has been very vocal, very outspoken. We've seen him do interviews. That's the one who said that he heard them say, "Take his gun and kill him with it." Um, and another officer mm -hmm. went up there. They were all up there. They wanted to meet with every member of the Senate because obviously this is important to them. Last week, the um, Capitol Police officers, a bunch of them got together and wrote a letter basically saying how this is dishonoring them. Like, what are you guys doing by not taking this commission seriously? And Mitch McConnell got nervous because he remembers back when the 9-11 commission happened, there was some opposition to that initially, but then the family members went up to Capitol Hill and started meeting with senators. And that is a really powerful tool. When you have family members of people who have suffered sitting in front of you, pleading with you to do the right oh, thing. Yes. It's really hard to say no. And Mitch McConnell started to go, oh shit, we might lose some senators. Um, I'm gonna have to call this favor in. And that's how we are where we are today. Susan Collins, to her credit, which you're not gonna hear me say often, <laughs> she met with the families <laughs> and was working out a compromise on some of the things some Republican senators wanted tweaked in the commission bill language. And she was getting it and Mitch McConnell put the kibosh on all of it. It is absolutely despicable. I don't wanna hear them ever say that they are pro-law enforcement. They, have, they are betraying their oath of office. They're betraying the constitution. They're betraying our democracy and they're betraying every man and woman, woman who wears that badge and who protected them that day from that crazy violent right. mob of Republican lunatics. So we need to do, I don't know what we do from here to make them pay for this, um, other than continue to rally people so that they can vote these bastards out of office. Absolutely. It is, it is. This is, this tells you where they are at. They are only about the retention and control of power. Yep. And they don't, they don't give a damn about the damage to the country that was done on that day. They don't want to look at it because they know they're going to find out that people like Josh Hawley and Ted Cruz and Ron Johnson, and of course, all the clowns in the house that were yeah. involved in this, are tied back into it. And Mitch McConnell asking for this as a personal favor, that in the, in the language of the Senate, in the secret handshake language of the Senate, is a very big deal. He is mm -hmm. terrified of this commission, which is why when they vote it down tomorrow, the Democrats should just announce the commission anyway, hold those seats open for the Republicans if they want to sit on the committee and move forward with it. They must not let Mitch McConnell roll them on this matter. We beg of you. Democratic leadership. You guys are in the majority. Puffing the Use hell up. the powers you have. Republicans were very good at that. You. That's correct. Hear, heed our warnings, please. Hi. Well, and this is what happens. It leads us to our next story tonight, which is basically the fraudits that are happening all over the country. <laughs> I love that word. Um, <laughs> I saw great. it somewhere. I can't take credit <laughs> for it. I, I read it somewhere and I was like, I'm so using that. Um, but that's exactly what they are, these farces. Um, mm -hmm. And Arizona was the, was the warning shot, right? We've been watching the cyber ninjas in uh, Arizona sniffing bamboo or whatever the hell they're doing out there with this asinine recount. Um, but it's, it's creating now, it's going on for weeks and it's going on longer than it was supposed to. And it's creating some problems, let's say, within the GOP in Arizona, the state and local level. You've got local officials, um, like the county recorder in Maricopa County, who is a Republican. Um, mm -hmm. I think his name is Stephen Richer. He, um, he was like, what the hell are we doing? This is ridiculous. These are conspiracy theories. We need to stop this. Other state senators out there are like, stop this. Um, but they're not, they're still going. And it, you know, <laughs> It's not legally enforceable, whatever they claim they find. I mean, these people don't know what the hell they're doing. 
But here's why it matters, Rick. It matters because other states now are looking at the template in Arizona. And there's a lot of states that are controlled by Republican legislatures. This is why folks down ballot races matter. What happens at the state and local level, this is where it really matters. Redistricting and voting rights. The secretaries of state in your state matter. They control these things. And everybody held up Brad Raffensperger out in Georgia as a hero during the uh, during the election mm-hmm. because they basically he was a stopgap to stop the stop the steal literally on the Trump side. But now in Georgia, they're trying to replicate what they did in Arizona, and he's acquiescing. So what happened is in the Washington Post, um, Greg Sargent wrote a piece basically explaining that Raffensperger, he was like, you know, well, we'll let we'll do another examination of the ballots in the in the issue of transparency. This way, they'll see just like the other two audits that they already did that were official that showed that, you know, Trump lost. But we'll we'll do this again because then we'll show again for the third time that it's transparent and that Trump lost. Not in so many words, but two that's what audits, he's trying to claim. Two audits and like five recounts. I mean, how many times does Donald Trump have to get his ass kicked in Georgia for pe- people to believe it? <laughs> right. It, it is right. astounding to me that, that well, and, and look, once again, what are you seeing? Raffensperger fears a Republican primary. He wants to keep his job. So he's going to get a Republican primary. By the way, no matter what you do, you've already crossed Donald Trump. You're going to get a yeah. Republican primary no matter what. That's right. You're going to get some cuckoo pants out there who believes that there's a you know secret cannibal pizza restaurant where they recounted the votes because George Soros told them to. You're going to get some lunatic, and you're going to try to run against the lunatic as a conservative Republican, and they're going to beat you because that's the flavor the GOP wants now is cuckoo. They that want the craze. That is correct. And you know what? Um, it's not only happening in Georgia. Remember, Georgia produced Marjorie Taylor Greene, um, but it's happening also now in Nevada. There was a story in Politico today yes. that Nevada is having like an internal Republican revolt because state of, and local officials out there in the Republican Party are arguing over how Trumpy they want to be. There's actually apparently some sane Republicans on the local level. They're like, yeah, we don't want to go that way. But the state party chair is real Trumpy, so much so that he's in bed with Proud Boys. And they he was patting right. the committee members with Proud Boys guys and so that he could so that they could get their people elected it, it, this is crazy this is happening all over the country with the republican party so this idea of the civil war yeah mm-hmm. there's a civil war but there's also like you, it looks like the crazies are going to win here and you know you wrote you wrote a piece in the washington post rick let's talk about that about like you want to some people For want sure. to look at trump in the rear view but he's not going anywhere and here are three examples right now in real time Right. It, it's true. And, and Tara, look, if, if you look at, if you go back in Nevada, and one of my close friends is, has an has a analogy of Nevada. He said, you know, patient zero of the craziness in Nevada was Sharon Angle back in 2010, oh, yes. who was after the Second Amendment remedies and all the crazy, crazy, right? That state has always had a dichotomy between some su- smart suburban Republicans and, and the edge cases, the people that live out in the desert and stare at the sun too long. Well, <laughs> these people are taking over. The lunatics are in charge of the asylum in, again. And it's the kind of thing I pointed out in the story that a lot of people who think that Trump is gone and it's over, they call him the former guy. What they're doing is expressing their... Anybody who uses the former guy as a, as a real term with Trump, not ironically, <laughs> is expressing their complete personal and political impotence at every level. They don't get it. They are just absolutely, completely dis- disassociated from the realities of Donald Trump. It is a, it is a pathetic play. It, as Steve Schmidt calls it, the Voldemort strategy. You can't yeah. pretend he's not there. Right. You can't just say, right. oh, he doesn't exist. It's going to go away. As I said in the story, it's like saying to your, your oncologist, hey, look, I know that MRI shows a big black spot on my lung. Let's not talk about it. Maybe it'll just go away. That is right. not what's happening. You can see the evidence in the state's over and over and over again. Like in Florida, the chairman of the Republican Party of Florida is the most Trumpy McTrumperson in the world. <laughs> and yet, and yet now I hear mumblings and rumblings that he's not good enough. 
Oh my God. He hasn't kissed ass enough. This guy is like so far over the edge. He's probably got like Donald Trump knee pads at home. Oh this God. guy, but, but, but in all these states, you're seeing this iterating over and over again, and it's going to get worse before it gets better. We keep telling them that, yet the Republicans in Politico again, story today, Republicans are, you know, behind the scenes, freaking out about Trump running in 2024 and the fact that he's lingering around. Well, what the hell did they think was going to happen? They honestly thought you in your piece, you you talk about Trump going off into exile like Napoleon. You call it Elba Largo, which I thought was very good. Um, I've actually I've actually been to Elba. It's a absolutely stunningly beautiful island in Italy. But anyway, um, so the Republicans are all worried. They're like, you know, you know, the Hollies and, and Cruz and Nikki Haley and all these you know, 2024 wannabes are all worried about Trump's going to hang around and, and not basically cock block them from running yes. in 2024. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what did you expect? And then you've got Paul Ryan now weighing into it. Paul Ryan tonight is um, giving a, a speech at the Ronald Reagan Library where he's allegedly supposed to go after Trump. I don't know if he'll actually name him um, about how, you know, the more establishment Republican orthodoxy needs to be the focus for the party. Yeah, good luck with that, Paul Ryan. Okay, where the hell Listen, have you if this been? Speech ends, if this speech ends with Paul Ryan offering to go and wash Trump's car at Mar-a-Lago, I won't be shocked. You know, Paul had <laughs> well, many, many opportunities yes. to, to reset what Trumpism was doing in the House. He had many opportunities to retake the agenda. He was in a position where he had a significant majority. He had, he had all the knowledge and power, and yet he chose because they dangled a board seat at Fox in front of him before he resigned and retired. That's right. He chose to soft pedal Trump because he knew Fox loved Trump and Rupert loved Trump. And it's so, so disappointing, uh, you know, listen, right? It's disappointing. Uh, it, it's Paul Ryan had so much promise. And yet, you know, I've, he, I've, he yeah. wussied out. I wrote about Paul in my first book, a guy I've known for many years, who was, you know, he was sort of like made in a laboratory as that modern compassionate conservatism uh, that was smart, that could reach the suburbs, that could talk to broader audiences. And now, you know, he's one more one more piece of roadkill so far. We'll see what he does, okay? And yeah, look, we'll I'm see. willing, if Paul Ryan comes out from, with his stature and position, comes out and says, I was wrong, I should have burned this lunatic authoritarian to the ground from the first day, that's one thing. But if it's Agreed. the usual mealy mouth, we should send a sternly worded letter, and you know, that'll teach him. Right. We'll go back right. to policy debates. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah. If it's that, nobody wants to hear that. Um, before we go to break, I want to remind folks, because Lincoln Project put out a little video, um, because Donald Trump emerged uh, for a Newsmax interview the other night. And um, this is who they want to be, the titular, uh, titular head of the Republican Party. Take a look. You look at what's going to happen. You look at gasoline. You look at what's going on with pricing. You look at what's going on there. You look at the military they're building. If you look at the world, I think this could have been another Spanish flu from 1917. When you're looking at all of the those flames on top of the wells, you look at some of these beautiful farms, you look at these incredible landscapes, and you take a look at those wind farms out there. You look at what the way they're treating Israel now. You look at the way they're being treated right now. If you look at uh, Alaska, you look at Iowa, you looked at North Carolina, you look at other states, big states and small states. If you look at every, every metric, you look at so many other things. When you look at what they did, it's so illegal. <laughs> Why do they miss this? Why do they miss this asinine idiot? I just, I, I don't get it. But anyway, uh, we're <laughs> going to shift gears because um, we're going to talk to people who we actually respect and who are honorable Americans, unlike exactly. Donald Trump. We'll be right back after the break with Dan Burkoff. In every generation, they stand. In every generation, they serve. In every generation, they sacrifice. For two and a half centuries, on land, sea, and in the air, they fought and died for an idea bigger than themselves. They are the Americans of every race and faith 
who swear a sacred oath of honor and live it to the last. And when that moment comes, they lay down their lives for the country they love, protecting their comrades, their families, and their nation. They are the bold angels now, examples to us all. On this day, let us honor their sacrifice and call upon ourselves to walk in their footsteps boldly, for they have led the way to the America we must be. The Lincoln Project is responsible for the content of this advertising. And welcome back to The Breakdown. Our first guest tonight is Dan Barkoff. He's a former Navy SEAL and president of Veterans for Responsible Leadership. Dan, thank you for being here with us tonight on The Breakdown. Tara, thanks for having me. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to follow a video of Donald Trump, but I'll try to do it by not being a slobbering idiot. <laughs> I, I the bar is set pretty low i think i i think you can I, manage it, is, it dan i i'm hoping so um, you know dan I, but i i hope dan just you know you're, you're kind of an underachiever uh i've noticed so you know nothing like harvard <laughs> medical school the navy seals and 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 the, and the naval academy i think right. you, i think That's you could right. be woken up out of a sound sleep and be better than donald trump well, you know, we, we, we keep our fingers crossed. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, well, since, you know, Rick gave you your proper accolades there and, um, you know, you are also a physician on top of being a Navy SEAL, um, Harvard trained. Um, but I wanted to talk to you. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your thoughts on what's happening with this January 6th commission and Officer Sicknick, who is now buried at Arlington Cemetery. He's a veteran. Um, his mother went up there. She's basically begging with these members of Congress, reminding them, you know, of the of the cost here. You know, that's and that's part of the theme of our show tonight, you know, is breaking down the the sacrifice that honorable Americans like yourself and others who choose service and remembering them for their sacrifices. And you look at this, how Republicans are just gaslighting the American people about what happened that day. Um, uh, what are your thoughts on that as you're watching this whole thing unfold? Yeah, it's a great question. So, you know, we talk about this pretty extensively at, at VFRL and, you know, the most shocking thing to us is the number of veterans who are involved um, and, and also a, a fair number of, uh, of active duty. There were a few reservists and uh, one at least active duty uh, field grade officer out of Quantico who was involved in this. But um, over 40 military veterans are, you know, buying into this stuff who actually participated in the January 6th uprising, who, you know, stormed the Capitol and were involved in all of that. And it, you know, it, it's it's twofold. It's it's really how how have we come, you know, so far afield from, you know, taking an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States of America to, uh, you know, being complicit with, uh, you know, this paranoid fringe that exists on the internet. So, um, you know, it, it's shocking and it's, it's breathtaking in, in its seriousness. It really strikes me, Dan, it's one of those things where, as you said, you know, where do you go from taking that oath of office to, to, uh, uh, to serve this country, even after you're out of uniform every day, 
um, to, to charging the steps of the Capitol in an attempt to overthrow uh, a, a small-D Democratic election. It really is kind of a stunning moment. And, you know, your group, Veterans for Responsible Leadership, has been very active in sort of calling on, um, you know, current serving military members and, and veterans to, to step up and, and to, to be, mm-hmm. you know, to, to live up to that oath. I, I really admire that. I think it's a fantastic uh, part of your mission. Rick, so, you know, there's this, uh, I don't know if this was told to me on the, the first day of medical school or, or later on, but, you know, pretty early in medical school, you know, they, they, they sit you down and, and I remember this professor telling this story and he was like, you know, these two guys walking along the river, right? And they see someone out in the middle of the river and they're drowning in the river. And, you know, they hop in, they go out, they save the guy, they drag him back. Okay. And they're like, wow, that was weird. And they, they go along with their walk and you know they see another guy middle of the river drowning they hop in they swim out they drag him out i'm like man these people keep falling in the river they go on a little further they see a third guy jumping in the river one guy you know runs out he's about to hop in the river and go save this guy and he looks at the other guy and he's running up the river right and he's like where are you going man we got to save this guy and the first guy's like you know what we got to figure out why all these people are falling in the damn river Right. So (laughs) both things are important. Right. Right. We got to figure out why these people are being radicalized and we got to stop it in its infancy. And at the same time, we have to deal with, you know, the the folks who, uh, you know, think it's okay to to storm the Capitol and then think it's okay to defend those that did. That's Mm -hmm. actually a a good a a good segue into my next question. What do you in your experience, because you've served and you've served at an Mm -hmm. elite level. Um, What do you think is the predicate for this extremism, this radicalism that we're seeing, um, this radicalization, actually, that we're seeing in the military and law enforcement, frankly? This is something that seems to be trending over the last few years. What what do you think it is? No, it's it's a great question. So, you know, when you think about someone who served in the military, right? Like when do they decide they're gonna join, you know, the the QAnon militia and kidnap a governor, right? So, you know, there's three possibilities. One, and this, we know this exists, and this was a problem back in kind of the nineties. There are white supremacist organizations that deliberately send members to go to the recruiting station and join up. Okay, that's a tiny minority. Some folks are getting radicalized in the military. And, you know, because of the UCMJ, because of the military, um, the way it, it operates, you know, the military needs to deal with that. But we've actually at VFRL have partnered with a couple of academics who've been studying this issue, uh, University of Maryland and University of Southern California. And uh, the vast majority of these folks who are who are taking this hard, hard right turn, it occurs when they get out. So they get out of the military, they go home, and then that's where they decide, you know, and, and that's the part, you know, we don't know, right? Like, did, is it a buddy who says, Let's go shoot guns in the woods and, you know, check out the, the Turner Diaries or whatever, you know, but, but that's where the mo- most people, it's when they go home and they link up with these folks. Right, right. Well, it is, it is certainly something that I, I, it looks like the military is now starting to take the radicalization stuff more seriously uh, since the administration, uh, since the Biden administration has taken over. Um, Thank God. And, and obviously, right, and obviously it's got a, it's got a, they've got a long way to go because I think you're right. Like the number of people that actually d- d- go to a recruiting station who are established white supremacists is probably de minimis. Mm-hmm. This is more of a social yep. problem and a civics problem, I think, th- than that. But it is definitely something they've got to, they've got to keep an eye on and focus down on and make sure that we, uh, you know, d- don't let that continue to grow and fester inside our military, which, you know, which should be a no. reflection of our best values, not our worst. Right. I, I couldn't agree more. You know, it's, it's really, um, you know, it's, it's, it's scary that folks are forgetting their oath and they're going home. They're going home to, to live that civilian life that, you know, you dream of when you're on depl- month nine of deployment or whatever. And, uh, you know, it's there that they're, they're getting, uh, you know, linked up with these, these folks who are, who are radicalizing them at home. Right. Right. Which actually leads to um, your thoughts on, uh, well, I guess it's been lack of leadership in at, at the highest levels under the Trump administration. There was the, just mm-hmm. the politicization of 
of our military and, and what was going on over there in the, in the Pentagon once um, Mattis left, uh, and especially mm -hmm. in, the, in the latter days. But leading up to the Capitol riots, you know, I see, I noticed something this, you know, with all of these militia groups, that there's a lot of imposter syndrome, you know, these wannabes mm -hmm. that can't cut it sure. like you and others who did, mm -hmm. who, who were able to achieve the, you know, the elite status in the military and they dress in the military garb and, you know, they wish they, they think they're Navy SEALs with their tactical formations and stuff. And all they are, are a bunch of, of incels that are wannabes, but yet They've been given an outlet here and latching on to Donald Trump and this weird obsession with him, this weird, I don't know how to explain it because he is the furthest from masculine, that uh, masculine guy ever. I don't, I don't understand the obsession with him. But when you look mm -hmm. at the Capitol riots, you've tweeted about this. Um, you know, what are your thoughts about some of like, the, the imposter syndrome and then like people like Ted Cruz, who's trying to talk about recently Right. He put out this video with with Russian propaganda in it, claiming that the, the Democrats are trying to, you know, make wussies out of our military. And yet look at the people in the Capitol riots and what they're doing. I think we have um, that that video, of Ted Cruz. We call him Ted Khrushchev. Let's take a look and get your reaction. What do you know about На что ты способен? Вопросы могут остаться без ответов. Но разве ты способен узнать себя? Познать границы своих возможностей? К черту границы! Ты... А без боя нет победы. Но на самом деле, главный враг – это задача выследить врага. Догнать его, превзойти, стать лучше, чем он. It begins in California. With a little girl raised by two moms. I also marched for equality. I like to think I've been defending freedom from an early age to marry my other mom. With such powerful role models, I finished high school at the top of my class. And after meeting with an army recruiter, I found it. A way to prove my inner strength. I'm U.S. Army Corporal Emma Malone Lord, and I answered my calling. Ted Cruz actually tweeted out, holy crap, perhaps a woke emasculated uh, army isn't the best idea. And he actually retweeted Russian propaganda. That's what that was in the first half of that. What's, what's your response to Ted Khrushchev? Yeah, so, um, so you know, the, the, the most charitable interpretation I can give to, to Ted's comments are that he's completely, he's completely ignorant, okay? Uh, I'm sure General Hurling would bat me up on this, but war is a team sport. Um, you know, the, the, the fact that um, a couple of Russian guys uh, static lining out of an airplane and shooting bolt action rifles does not intimidate me. This has been a, <laughs> uh, a constant theme throughout uh, American history, right? We weren't going to be able to stand up to the British Redcoats. We weren't going to be able to stand up to, uh, you know, the, the Confederates, uh, you know, they were better soldiers than, than the, us Yankees. Uh, you know, we weren't going to be able to stand up to the German supermen. Um, you know, we weren't going to be able to stand up in the fold the gap to the, to the Russians. I mean, this, you know, Al Qaeda thinks we're soft, right? Like this has been a constant thing that people have said about a democratic nation. Um, but you know, there's just there's a lot of dead people who took that opinion and uh, and met up with the U.S. armed forces overseas and, and learned the hard way that that is not correct. So um, so there's that. And, you know, the charitable interpretation is Ted doesn't know what he's talking about. He's never served a day in his life. Now, brings me to the second point. OK, so, you know, there's um, a, a young woman, uh, an army enlisted woman who uh, does a recruiting video. I'm sure it was not her idea. Um, you know, I'm sure she was approached and, uh, you know, do you think our, our, our military is better served by, uh, all sorts of folks who volunteer to be there, right? So 1973, we get rid of the draft. There is no more conscription. We now have people who volunteer and want to be there and want to serve and want to be a soldier. That is better. That's better. There are problems with an all volunteer force. And, you know, there are people who get PhDs about, you know, all the problems with the volunteer force. But truth be told, we are better off with men and women in uniform who want to be there. That's right. I think that's fair to say. And Ted you know, Cruz. I, I, one of the things I observed was, you know, yeah, <laughs> ahead, Ted, that, 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 you know, Ted Cruz, speaking of emasculated, you know, Donald right. Trump walks around with Ted Cruz's pecker in his pocket every day. 
I mean, the guy, Donald Trump told Ted Cruz his dad killed JFK and his wife was ugly. There's no, Ted Cruz has zero room to talk about emasculation anywhere Absolutely. at any time. That's right. Can't even defend his own wife. Yep. Never mind, never mind standing post with a rifle. I don't think so. Yeah. Go ahead, Rick, so. before we wrap it up. No, no, no. Yeah, let's, I, I just wanted to thank Dan for being with us tonight. It's, uh, it's always terrific to see you. And, uh, and Veterans for Responsible Leadership does amazing work. And, uh, and, and I, this is a great time of year in the great state of Vermont. It's about to be beautiful there. So It's finally, you know, uh, Vermont is terrific from June 1st to Christmas. And, yeah, and it's still pretty exactly. Good, but, you know, <laughs> well, Dan, well, thank we you again, appreciate Dan. you. We appreciate you being with us. Thank you All so right, much. Take care. Good night. If, you, if you'd like to know more about Veterans for Responsible Leadership, visit VFRL.com. Coming up after the break, we'll have retired Lieutenant General Mark Hurtling, who Dan referenced. He will be here with us to discuss all things Memorial Day, talk a little more about Ted Khrushchev, and get a little history lesson about uh, the battlefields in Europe. Stay tuned. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. I pledge allegiance to the flag of I the United States of America. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And to, to the, the republic, republic for which it stands. stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for Trump. is responsible for the content of this advertising. If you are fighting the American nation state, if you are fighting the values and virtues that make this country great, the conservative movement should be about nothing if not reducing your power and if necessary, destroying you. I'm certain that none of your members were in any communication with any of the people who uh, stormed Capitol Hill. Well, thank you for the question. Everybody have a nice day. We can look back in a time in history where people were told to wear a gold star and they were definitely treated like second class citizens, so much so that they were put in trains and taken to gas chambers in Nazi Germany. And this is exactly the type of abuse that Nancy Pelosi is talking about. Have a nice day. When they do their satanic rituals, they have to wear a mask and they have to stand six feet apart. Sound familiar? Everybody have a nice day. Check the record, do your research. And welcome back to The Breakdown. Coming up in just a minute, we'll get to more of your questions, but first we want our next guest. He's amazing. He served 37 Absolutely. years in the Army, retired as Commanding General. He commanded the U.S. Army in Europe and the Seventh Army. And I am so pleased to welcome my friend, Mark Hurtling. He will not let me call him Lieutenant General. So for those who are, don't yell at us, if we don't call him General Hurtling, he prefers to be the colloquialism of Mark. Mark, welcome. <laughs> Hi, Tara. How are you doing, Rick? What's going on? You, you hey, Mark. Good to see you again. <laughs> <laughs> I could call you I'm Dr. Hurtling. It's lovely. <laughs> right, we could call him Dr. Hurtling. It. Yeah, you should have right? kept going with Dan. I was enjoying what he was saying. It was great. <laughs> he, is, he is a pistol, man. I love that guy. 
He really yeah, is. He uh, really I wanted to ask that. you about Eric Greitens in Missouri. I didn't get to that. Oh, you oh, should have. Don't do that. The SEAL, well, the SEAL community has feelings on that. Oh, yeah, they, they have a lot sure. of feelings about him and a couple other SEALs, too, as I, as I uh-huh. know. But uh, I'm, yeah. I'm from, originally from Missouri, so I know their politics okay. have gone uh, pretty far south. Yeah, I think for, they're trying to redo yeah. the Dred Scott case right now, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, but it's not, you know? Yeah, no, right? Not. They might. Lordy. Good Lord. So, so Mark, the reason why I said... Tonight? Yeah, the reason why I said we could call you doctor is because you recently got your PhD. So I was just uh, giving you the proper accolades that you deserve because you're extraordinary. Um, so we wanted to talk because you know our theme tonight is about Memorial Day and honoring uh, our men and women who have given their lives in service. And um, you know, given your command, the time that you spent in Europe, I, I, I personally requested you because you have such amazing knowledge about those hallowed grounds where our soldiers fought World War II. Um, yeah. And um, so I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about that a little bit. But before we do that, I wanted to get your reaction to the Ted Khrushchev thing. We just got done talking to Dan about it. And I, he, you know, <laughs> he said that you would have some commentary on it. I figured you would, and I wanted to give you a chance to react to it. Well, I, I think Dan said that because he probably saw me on Anderson Cooper talking about it in a very visceral way because it just mm-hmm. pissed me off. And by the way, Rick, I, if I can go to you and just say that I think if you put Corporal Menardelard, I think is how you pronounce her name, I'm not sure. Uh-huh. She was one of five people in those commercials. But I think if you put her in a cage match with Ted Cruz, she will oh, she'd beat him his him ass. For 15 seconds. There's no doubt in my mind about that. But anyway, no question in my mind. Let's get a little bit more professional. Uh, yeah, he, I, I think he was way... I, the sad thing about what I think Cruz did, Senator Cruz did was, yeah, it caused a lot of people to have visceral reactions to what he was saying. But as Rick and others have said, and I think, Terry, you mentioned it too, is there is a bigger strategy to this. And it's the continued divisiveness of our society which is just really sad. To have the, the, the macho image of the civilians wearing camo and toting around AR-15s and being the manly men with the flags behind their truck, like Dan said, I mean, that's not soldiering. And oh, by the way, the comparison to the Russian, which I think was pretty interesting, that, that was probably a bunch of Drago lookalikes in that film. And the Russian army ain't made up of those kind of guys. No. Trust me, because I've worked with the Russian army. They are a conscript army. They spend one year in uniform and then they're gone. And the one year most of them serve in uniform, they don't like being there because they are treated uh, very poorly and not fed very well and live in uh, right. large cold barracks with bunks next to each other. So, yeah, you know, comparing the U.S. military to the Russian military uh, based on a propaganda film is not the best approach by an acting U.S. senator. For sure, uh, and, and it is it is one of those things that that you know, as as you pointed out, this is a big a, a big complex team sport, and and the fact is we need we need people from every background. It isn't just trigger pullers. It there's yep. a there's a huge diversity in in our forces spanning every part of the spectrum of conflict from intelligence to the guys who kick down doors, and we need a lot of people who can do a lot of things that aren't. The stereotypical like Ted Cruz idea of 1980s adventure movie military service. Well, here, here's the thing. If I can comment on that, Rick, you know, Dan was a true trigger puller and a knuckle dragger yeah. seal. Okay, so he had <laughs> yeah. that M4 yeah. with him with the scope and all that other stuff. This corporal that Cruz was making fun of was a trigger puller too. Except her, she's pulling the trigger on a Patriot missile. So yeah, that's, right. that's a little bit bigger weapon system than an M4. And those, those air defenders that, that man those uh, uh, pieces of equipment are in places like Kuwait, uh, mm-hmm. Europe, Korea, to guard against yep. incoming missiles. They used to be in Israel, too, uh, reinforcing right. uh, the Iron Dome. The, so, yeah, mm-hmm. it's, it's, just, it's just staggeringly stupid what some of these people in the Senate are saying. It is. It really is quite something. And they think that they're pro-military, 
right? Yeah. Like they, they walk yeah. around puffing their chests about how, you know, God bless America and our troops, you know, and, um, but yet they just continue to use them as political pawns. And it, it pisses me off. It, it, this era of Trump has really um, diminished a lot of, of that, a lot of our reverence for the military, like, you know, like their little, you know, GI Joe men to put on a, on a board. I, it, it, it's, just so unbecoming and disrespectful to those who actually do serve, especially from a wuss like Ted Cruz. Like I just, <laughs> that makes it just adds insult to injury. But speaking of adding insult to injury, I wanted to ask you, Mark, if you are familiar with this guy. Um, he's retired, Douglas McGregor. He's on the uh, West Point um, <laughs> Visitors Board. Um, but, but based on your chuckle, I'm assuming you're familiar with him, yes? Yeah, I'm, I'm very familiar with uh, Colonel Retired McGregor. We were peers. Uh, for a while, and in fact, we were, he was with the 2nd Cavalry Regiment when I was with uh, the 1st Cav in 1st Armored Division during Desert Storm. So I watched uh, Colonel McGregor do his thing and he is, he's a unique individual. Let's just put it that way. Not yes. very well accepted by his peers. Yes, and the reason why he I does brought not him up- and play well with others. Well, I can see why based on some of the comments and things that he's made yeah. um, since retirement. I don't know what he did when he was active, but since he's been out, he's been really outspoken about some pretty um, white supremacist type things about immigrants and um, you know white replacement theory. And he's been unapologetic yeah. about that. And CNN's K-File, um, by the way, the guy who runs K-File, Andrew Kaczynski, was an intern in the office that I worked in in Congress. So it's really great to see him <laughs> uncover all these great videos and things. Um, but anyway, um, the, the K-File uncovered this, uh, this interview of him talking about white replacement theory. And, and, you know, that's, yeah. you know, that's the goal of Democrats is to bring in all these brown people and all these other others that are not European to replace us. And it's pretty horrific. Um, but he's on the, the West Point, the Military Academy Visitors Board. It's a presidential appointment, shocker, appointed by Trump. What do we do with this guy? What happens here? Well, he, he is on the board as well as a couple of others that, that pre former President Trump appointed that are a little bit out there. You know, when you talk about the visitors board at West Point, they are there to really design and help the superintendent of the academy uh, have the best possible character development and leadership development as well as academic and sports program as they possibly can. Uh, so when you have characters, instead of those forming character development, you're going to have problems. What can you do about it? I don't know, truthfully. Uh, it, it is a, I think it's a four-year appointment, uh, but, but I think it can be overcome by the Biden administration. And, and President Biden is slowly countering some of those things. I just read today where, where he uh, 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 severed the relationship of a, of a former a Navy SEAL who Dan also doesn't like, but I won't mention his name, uh, <laughs> running oil in northern Syria to the, to the Kurdish region uh, under a very tenuous project that he worked through the State Department. Just crazy stuff. But all of that is neither here nor there. I'm going to answer your question because I want to get to it. It's important about the, the cemeteries in Europe and the difference between us and others. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was commanding in Europe, a couple of times over there, I had just returned. Well, all the times I was in Europe, I had just returned from Iraq. Uh, so I had three tours in Iraq, and each time my family was stationed in Europe. I got to know the cemeteries. Uh, you know, most of the military cemeteries in the United States are run by the, the Veterans Administration, but all the overseas ones are run by something called the uh, American Battle Monuments Commission. There's 28 of them. And 19 of them are in, in Europe, and I've visited all of them. And they are unbelievable. If, if you're talking about a Memorial Day at Arlington, it, there's a lot of pomp and circumstances. I would suggest you sometimes take a trip to Europe and go to either Margraten in the Netherlands or Normandy in France or any mm -hmm. Anzio in Italy and see what the people who have from those countries have done to adopt the graves of American soldiers uh, and, and make them their own and use them as teaching points about liberty and freedom and social contract. You know, the, the other thing I'd say too, Tara, if I can continue a little bit. Sure. You know, Rick was talking before about, to Dan about, uh, you know, the, the, the character of soldiers. 
And one of the things I used to do as a commanding general is I would go around and talk, talk to soldiers from other countries because we had 49 different countries in Europe that I was partnering with. And I would ask the other countries, what do you take a vow to? What do you vow to defend? And I'd get really great answers like the motherland or the fatherland or El Presidente or the king or the queen or whatever. And it's all very different than what U.S. soldiers vow to defend. They defend a piece of paper, which represents ideas. And those ideas are found in values and a social contract and liberties and freedoms that we have. And we, we've got young men and women who fight to defend ideas as opposed to a piece of ground or a person. And that should never change. Right. Uh, I, I did this last time with Memorial Day. I keep a box on my desk uh, with the cards of 253 soldiers that were under my command in combat that gave their life, made the ultimate sacrifice. I look at the, that box every day. I know the story of all of those individuals, 253 of them. And you say, wow. You know, these are folks that went to foreign countries and those cemeteries in Europe. It's the only plot of ground we occupy in Europe from the World War One and World War Two era. Those are the only things we ask of is some place to bury our dead. Uh, so this Memorial Day is, is I think that's what you wanted me to talk a little bit about, is really important sure. to me, having served with these great men and women who gave their ultimate sacrifice. And by the way, there's a couple of allied soldiers from Latvia and Ukraine in this box too, that fought alongside of us. All of that's important. Mm -hmm. For sure. And, and you know, it is, it is one of those things where I think we have to divide between the symbolic sort of rah-rah of we love our troops to the, to, to the, the respect they are owed and that, and that our obligation as citizens demands of us when we see those kind of sacrifices. Um, and, and and I don't think as a society we understand them well enough and feel them deeply enough because so few people actually serve that I think there's often a, a big distance emotionally with with the lives of these people. And I think that's I think it's one of the things I really I'm very grateful for your explication of that. And I saw that box and I I I I, I it was very moving because it's you yeah. you know you clearly those people have a story and you're and you're you've taken the responsibility of carrying those things forward. And I, I truly admire that. Yeah. It's important. Uh, well, it is important, yeah. which is, um, you know, to Rick's Just point like as well. Officer Sicknick. Just like Officer Sicknick is important right now. Yes. And you were talking about that early on. Uh, yeah. And that's something that we should stand up for and, and not let people get away with brushing this under the rug. 100%, which is why we continually bring this up. This is why we, you know, will never let folks forget it. Um, that's why we wanted to do the show tonight and, and honor Memorial Day properly. You know, it's not just about barbecues and opening the pool and right. sales and, you know, the commercialization of Memorial Day, I think is a bit disrespectful to some degree. Um, and it's important for people to understand that Memorial Day is about honoring those who gave the ultimate sacrifice, which was, you know, losing their lives versus Veterans Day, which is honoring everyone who serves. But Memorial Day has a, a more specific meaning, and it's important to make that distinction as well. Um, so uh, that's why I wanted to have you on, uh, Mark. Because can, can I say one more thing job. about that? I, sure. I know you're getting into the Q&A section that you want to do, but, that's okay. you know, my, my favorite movie of all time is Saving Private Ryan. And, mm -hmm. and there's a great scene at the end of that movie where Tom Hanks pulls uh, Matt Damon into him close. And as Hanks is dying, Captain Miller is dying, he says, earn this, earn yeah. this, what we have given to save your life. And, and then it fast forwards to, to old man Private Ryan mm -hmm. in the cemetery at Normandy with his family. And he turns to his, his wife and says, tell me I'm a good man. Mm -hmm. Tell me I've deserved what they did for me. And that's what I think we need to go back to as a nation is earning the things that so many people have sacrificed for. And it's unfortunately not what we're seeing today. Absolutely. Lieutenant General Mark Hurtling with all the feels tonight. Um, that gave Thank me chills. You, <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. You, um, we appreciate your service and um, 
we will have you back. I was going to ask you about your love of pink because we share our affinity for pink. And I saw that you <laughs> tweeted about her, but I, I didn't did. want to end it. You, you had such a solemn note. I didn't think it was appropriate <laughs> unless you if want you to comment. If you haven't seen on that documentary on Prime, watch <laughs> it. It is unbelievable. She is she's okay. phenomenal. She is really phenomenal. Okay. But yes, we can end on a happy note. Let's do that. Yes. Okay? I love Good. that. I Thanks. love that. Thank you, well, Mark. We, all, we really appreciate aspects. you as always. He's a well-rounded guy. Keep doing good things, okay? Thank Thanks, you, sir. Mark. We will. We appreciate you. Okay. Take care. <laughs> See? He, I wanted to show the softer, gentler Who side knew? of Mark Hurtling. I know. I was like, I did not peg him as a pink fan, but hey, he, the guy knows good music and talent. I love it. I love it. You wouldn't know that him. I love Norwegian death metal. Oh, God. Are we, maybe we should open the show with that next time. That's it. You got to pick out your favorite, your favorite one, or maybe we'll end the show on your favorite Norwegian death metal band for God's sakes. Let's take an now audience like, tweet, please. Like <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. Ask the breakdown. Deldra Banks, as a mentor to young people, how does one keep them encouraged to vote and stay awake when they continue to be frustrated by all the BS and the inability of Congress to hold itself accountable for any of its members' actions. Deirdre, you know, I think the best way is to make it relatable to their lives. If they right. feel frustrated about it, they have to be reminded that we control the elected officials. It's up to us. And when you're complacent and throw your hands up, that's when they win. Do not give them the power. People who are elected right. work for you and me. It, they work for voting, uh, the voting public. And our founding fathers designed it that way. But when, when you're complacent and you're not engaged and you're not paying attention, then the bad actors win. So make yeah. it relatable to them and explain to them what's at stake if they give up. Rick, anything to add? And not everything, I mean, one of the things to explain to them is not everything's gonna be easy or quick or simple. It's a, it, you know, right. the work of maintaining a constitutional republic is work. It takes some, you know, and in our, in our society, we don't, we're not as accustomed to that anymore. So we need to, to remind people that you have to stay vigilant. You have to stay alert. You have to keep working the problem. You have to keep striving to meet all those goals that we set for That's ourselves right. as a nation and to keep bending that arc. That's right. Toward justice. Martin Luther King, thank you for your wise words interpreted by Rick Wilson. Next one. <laughs> Dan Collins, uh, should the Democrats appoint a special investigator if they cannot create a 1-6 commission? So Rick, yes. you know, also, there's a yes. lot of options here, right? Sure. The things that they can do. Look, that, and, and look, the, the idea that the Democrats lose once Mitch McConnell kills this through cloture is, is, is mistaken. They can still move forward with an investigation. They can still go forward and do a lot of things that reveal who is behind this, what drove this, who organized it, what the actions of these people were on the Hill that day, who was throwing the bricks, who was causing the problem. And to go back, as an investigator can also go back and go through the criminal conspiracy of the Stop the Steal movement with people like Roger Stone and Ali Alexander and Amy Kremer and all these other scumbags all these are the low rent, anti-American scumbag terrorist sympathizers, and they can go through and they can drag those people up. And they can get them to testify. They can put them in the legal jeopardy they richly fucking deserve. Amen. We'll take one more and then we're going to take a quick break and do our Memorial Day honoring. I can't wait. Okay. Uh, Marianne tweets, how can we get Marjorie Taylor Greene expelled? I know Kevin McCarthy finally got his balls back from Trump, but why won't he get rid of her? COVID is nothing like the Holocaust, signed confuzzled Jew in California. <laughs> well, Marianne, you know, I, I would argue that um, Kevin McCarthy does not have his balls back. Um, they are no. firmly ensconced in Donald Trump's hands and he, he'll never get them back because he's given them away. They are separated right. from his body. Um, and that's why he won't reprimand her. That's why he won't expel her or move to actually do anything to punish her and her despicable behavior because he's afraid of daddy. That's right. He is, yeah, I couldn't have said it better, Tara. It's, just, it's exactly <laughs> right. The, the, the predicate of your question, I appreciate your question, but the predicate of it is wrong. Kevin's balls are far, far away. 
They're in Donald <laughs> Trump's lockbox in Mar-a-Lago. <laughs> yes. He's probably got he's... like a room of those for Republicans at this point. Maybe a suite or a, or a whole a whole a wing of Mar-a-Lago dedicated yes. to the balls of Republican politicians who he has emasculated. Yes, with he probably Ted takes Cruz. it with him. Right. Right. There's probably a special Ted Cruz viewing room. <laughs> oh, oh, God. I don't want to view any Republican balls. Oh, they're probably too small to find anyway, right next to Trump's. All right. I'm just going to stop next, right now. Nothing yeah, good will come stop. of anything I no, say from here on. No. <laughs> I think we've officially, uh, it, you know, done that conversation way too much justice. Um, next up for this Memorial Day, we're going to get back a little more serious. And um, I'm going to be remembering someone very close to my heart and um, some of our production crew's family members as well on this Memorial Day. So stay tuned for it. We'll be right back. Executive Mansion, Washington, November 21, 1864. Dear Madam, I have been shown in the files of the War Department a statement of the Adjutant General of Massachusetts that you are the mother of five sons who have died gloriously on the field of battle. I feel how weak and fruitless must be any word of mine which should attempt to beguile you from the grief of a loss so overwhelming. But I cannot refrain from tendering you the consolation that may be found in the thanks of the Republic they died to save. I pray that our Heavenly Father may assuage the anguish of your bereavement and leave you only the cherished memory of the loved and lost, and the solemn pride that must be yours to have laid so costly a sacrifice upon the altar of freedom. Yours very sincerely and respectfully, Abraham Lincoln. The Lincoln Project is responsible for the content of this advertising. America is the only country founded on an idea, the radical idea that citizens could govern themselves. It was called the American Experiment because there was no reason to believe it would work. A republic, if you can keep it. Every generation has been called to defend and renew the promise of America. For some, it was on the battlefield. For others, it was on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Now, the battle has come to the steps of the capital itself. Democracy is under assault like no time since 1860. We have a choice. Look away or stand up and fight. It's not about conservative or liberal. It's about freedom versus autocracy. We didn't choose this moment, but history has chosen us. Which side are you on? The Lincoln Project is responsible for the content of this advertising. And welcome back to The Breakdown. Uh, Rick, I just saw the ad for the gear store. I'm excited know, to get right? some more gear. We have lots of gear coming. And by the way, I, I, I don't know if we've done the, a lot of this yet. I saw we had the pet bandanas. I have so many animals. We need an expansive <laughs> line of pet LP pet gear. I mean, like dog dog vests and the whole the whole shenanigan. I, I'm, I'm going to get on this one. Yes. I, I, I'm not going to push my idea for an LP horse blanket because <laughs> that's, that's a fairly narrow market. But we're going to have some more LP pet gear. And then we're going to have people sending pictures of their pets with their yes. LP pet gear. It's, Indeed. It's been decided. Believe me. Yes, and Tiki will <laughs> proudly wear an LP shirt. He yes. does wear clothes. Yeah, he wears his Giants jersey when we travel. So yes, we're going to make I it happen that. for the summer. <laughs> I love that. So, um, 
So this is how we're going to end the show tonight, Rick. This was um, something that I felt very passionate about and that I wanted to do and give our crew an opportunity to honor their family members as well. But um, so as Memorial Day approaches, the crew here at The Breakdown, they've taken some breaks from their usual work producing our show to remember those who served in our own families, uh, a few of whom we've recently lost. Right. And while Memorial Day is all about remembering those who died in the line of duty, as I was explaining earlier, the difference between Memorial Day and Veterans Day. But uh, we think it's incredibly important now more than ever to honor those who've put their lives on the line for our constitution, our democracy, and us. So tonight I want to honor my grandfather, Emil Hugo Setmayer. He's a retired captain. He served 39 years as a police officer. He also served in World War II and he was a volunteer fireman for 70 years and um, he did pass away in 2016. But what you're seeing right now is um, a tradition that my grandfather um, engaged in every Memorial Day weekend. Um, he was a member of the VFW, also the American Legion, and he would sell poppies. And these are some pictures that you're seeing mm -hmm. of my grandfather mm -hmm. selling his poppies. And he was always the number one poppy seller because he was quite the guy, very charming, and everybody knew him. Um, but I thought it was important for people to understand why this was important. Because to Rick's point earlier, sometimes we lose the significance of these um, momentous times and these, these traditions in our country, particularly as the greatest generation is dying off. Um, I want to make sure that in my family that those traditions stay alive. So a little history on why poppies, for those who don't know. Um, so after World War I, the pop poppies flourished in Europe. And scientists attributed this to the growth in the soils because of lime from the rubble left behind by the war, particularly in France and Belgium. They became enriched with this. And from the dirt and mud grew these beautiful red poppy fields. And the red poppy then be, um, came to symbolize the bloodshed during battle following the publication of this wartime poem called In Flanders Fields. Now the poem was written by Lieutenant Colonel John McRae and uh, while he was serving on the front lines in World War I. And on September 27th, 1920, the poppy became the official flower of the American Legion family to memorialize soldiers who fought and died during the war. In 1924, the distribution of poppies became a national program of the American Legion, and that's a tradition that still carries on to this day, thus the pictures of my grandfather. Um, Congress actually, which I did not know this, they actually designated the Friday before Memorial Day as National Poppy Day. So that's tomorrow, May 28th. And um, I encourage everyone to please show, so show your support. You can purchase and wear um, your poppies. Usually people sell them still um, at you know supermarkets. You'll see the VFW guys or American Legion guys out there. I think you can order them, um, but you can wear and display them. Um, you can post pictures. The American Legion has a virtual poppy garden on Instagram and Twitter, and you can use the hashtag poppy day. And that's a picture right there um, of the poppy that I keep in my car all the time. It's been there for many years. That is one of my grandfather's poppies. Um, and it's been in every car I've ever owned since, oh, I don't know, 2015 or so. I always keep a little piece of my grandfather with me. And I have one other poppy that I always keep close to me. It's in my kitchen that I took out so I could show you guys on the show. But um, I always keep a little piece of my grandfather with me and because um, I'm proud of his service. So um, so yeah, support the American Legion because all the proceeds from the purchases of the poppies, it goes to support programs for veterans, military communities and their families. And so the expression, their, their motto is honor the fallen, support the living. So that's our little history lesson about Poppy's Memorial Day and my grandfather, my gramps. And now I'd like to take a moment to remember the family members of our time. LPTV crew that has served and uh, passed away. Um, first, the grandfather or the Jidu in Arabic of our booker, Melanie Lawrence Lori Ganim. Lawrence Lori Ganim. He served in the United States Army during World War II and he received a Purple Heart. And we're featuring the late grandfathers of the Lincoln Project's Deputy Creative Director, Michelle. It's also assists Rick and I, we love Michelle. This is John Dolly. He served in the United States Navy and was recalled to duty for the Korean War. 
He went on to serve 25 years in the Watertown Police Department in upstate New York. We'd also like to honor Michelle's other grandpa, David Kinney. He was inducted into the United States Navy in 1943 at the age of 17. He went on to serve for 30 years in the Watertown City Fire Department in New York. I love it, a family of firemen and policemen. My grandfather was both, and there was always rivalries during 4th of July. But when 4th of July comes up, I'll tell those stories. Um, and finally, we are featuring First Lieutenant Robert Winthrop Keene, the late grandfather of our executive producer, George. He served in the second division of the American Ex Expeditionary Forces during World War I and was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross. We uh, honor and salute our family members, greatest generation. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to do that because I don't think we do it enough. So there they are and we thank them and thank our crew for putting, for sharing their, their families with us. And finally tonight, um, we'd like to uh, honor another kind of hero. Since we're always talking about our pets, we want to honor war dogs. This is actually a thing. These um, animals, the service animals who serve in our military, military dogs, they've been used in the battlefield for thousands of years. But in the United States, they were, began officially recognized during World War II. And in Michigan, Rick, did you know this, that there's a war dog memorial in South I Lyons, did not Michigan? Know that. I didn't either I did not until we did that. research for this. And I'm thrilled to hear it. There is the War Dog Memorial in South Lyons, Michigan, and they provide burial with full honors at no cost to, to the service dog's handler. I think that's amazing. So if you guys uh, like that too, you're always welcome to donate. You can visit mwdm.org. So we honor even our four-legged heroes on the show. Well, Rick, it's been a great show. It has, Tara. I will yes. see you again on, well, I'll see you like every day, but I'll, I'll yes. see you again you'll, on Tuesday. <laughs> you'll see me later. Um, but I'll for, see you for later. our folks out there, our Lincoln Project supporters, make sure you subscribe and listen to the Lincoln Project podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Play. Rick and I are on the latest episode. We, have, we cut up and have some more fun there. And of course, check out our sister show, We're Speaking, and we will see you guys next Tuesday. 8 p.m. Thanks, everybody.